in ethics. But just a couple of words on how this project uh, came about. It was born uh, from the Athens Democracy Forum that we run. Uh, it was founded, we founded the Democracy Forum in the New York Times some 10 years ago. Um, and just a few years ago, we turned the whole operation into a non-profit structure so we could actually do things and not just talk about things. So this is actually a round table uh, with the intention of coming up with a very specific policy recommendation that we as a foundation will take and try and implement in some shape or form. Uh, it is very much part of a global effort. Uh, there are seven building blocks that uh, came out of uh, the Athens Democracy Forum two years ago. This is one of them. Um, the other six being the power of the people, power of voting, the executive, uh, political party reform, uh, information and business, money. Um, so we've gone to about 12 cities around the world uh, last year and this year with expert roundtables like this, but also uh, citizen consultations so we can get the voice of citizens. As far as this particular one, AI and ethics is, this is more like the expert roundtable or workshop part of it, and then next year we'll be doing more citizen-led consultations on this topic. Um, and the ultimate goal is to implement these policy recommendations and to also uh, formulate a, a global hub, if you like, or a global center for democracy uh, where it becomes uh, a, an ongoing process of, of coming up with policy recommendations and implementing them. So that's it. I think everybody wants to hear from the experts, so uh, over to you. Thank you very much for, for your time today. Thanks a lot, uh, Achilles. And uh, uh, coming back to um, the relevance of the topic, uh, we've, been, uh, we've been all witnessing, I think, in the, in the past, uh, we've been discussing about artificial intelligence and algorithm and their influence on democracy. Since since years, uh, at least we can say that uh, uh, the the breakthrough uh, has been uh, the the scandals uh, back in uh, 2015, 16, uh, Oxford Analytica, um, uh, Cambridge Analytica. Sorry, uh, Oxford Analytica will 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 uh, will. Uh <laughs> Uh, quote me in, in, in the course otherwise. Uh, Cambridge Analytica and, uh, and everything that went through uh, during uh, the, the Brexit uh, uh, debate and then the, the Donald Trump election and so forth. I mean, this, this has become like household kind of discussion, you know, something that uh, before it was uh, really a, a niche conversation around experts, uh, engineers, uh, coders, and so on, it became uh, something of general concern already. But in the past 10 months, uh, I think that there has been a quantum leap, uh, literally, in, uh, in the conversation when generative uh, artificial intelligence has been uh, uh, as well uh, being uh, um, out there uh, and, and, and tested uh, for the larger uh, public. Uh, there are, there are definitely uh, things that we didn't really imagine uh, could have been so fast uh, to, to be developed that, that have been developed very, very fast in, past in the past uh, few months. And therefore, this topic is again uh, uh, being, uh, being uh, at the center of the, um, of the debate about the future of our societies in general, the future of our jobs, the futures of our democracy. So we are going to, to uh, uh, discuss this from a specific point of view, which is the one of ethics, and about these building blocks of democracy, which are the values which, uh, which our societies are building upon, especially those societies that uh, uh, really uh, are structured on the values of uh, rule of law, human rights, uh, and, uh, uh, um, and so forth, inclusiv inclusiveness, diversity, and so on what kind of challenges there are over there, but also we want to discuss, as you say, 
this is a little bit uh, ambitious to come up with policy recommendations in, uh, in an hour and, and, and a little bit more than an hour conversation, but definitely what we can do because we have uh, experience from the institutional side, experience from the, the think tank world, from the uh, companies and so forth, from the academia, I think definitely we can have a little bit of a, of a taste of uh, what are the debates in, different in these different universes and how they cross-sect uh, with each other. Uh, in particular, we are going to set some bigger questions uh, uh, which, um, which we want to try at least to, to explore, if not to answer. Uh, and I would like to start maybe, uh, and I look at, uh, at Jeremy if uh, he would like to, to help because I, I'm also looking at Jeremy for because he's from Microsoft and uh, Microsoft is really now on the, on the front uh, line on uh, implementing uh, artificial intelligence. Um, we've been hearing about uh, Copilot, uh, uh, which is going to be uh, implemented within uh, Office 365 quite soon. Uh, we are observing uh, this, it might revolutionize completely the way we are uh, doing our daily job. Uh, well no matter what kind of jobs you're doing, but if you're using any kind of interface that requires sending an email or writing a document or doing some uh, Excel uh, or, or you know, uh, numbers, will we'll be affected to that. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that, uh, Jeremy, you are in, the, in your company you are reflecting on uh, uh, on one hand the challenge of uh, transparency and understanding uh, of, of the algorithm on one side on the o on the other side uh, the, the the challenge of keeping innovating and and keeping this uh, uh, to be something that is cutting edge and uh, but as well the consumer side uh, of, of the world of the world situation so perhaps you could uh, kick off the conversation by giving us uh, an overview on uh, on that Definitely, I can definitely try. I think it's interesting that you referenced the co-pilot, and I think that comes back to one of the overarching questions of this conference. You know, we are trying, and I think it's important to emphasize, you know, the human element of leveraging these tools, right? This is not going to replace humans, but I do think there's certain tasks that can be optimized, and it's something to be excited about. At the same time, you know, we, we don't minimize the risks here. As, as you said, this year things have taken a big leap forward, I think. I always say that when my, my mother starts using these technologies and asking questions, it's getting much more tangible now. People are interfacing with this more than they used to. It's no longer an academic discussion. We see this as a very important year. In fact, we're even seeing an increasing amount of industry announcements um, innovating in this space. I think one thing that's important to remember too is that despite some of the recent announcements around ChatGPT, you know, there's so much more to AI than large language models, I mean, many of which have been in existence for some time and you may have been interfacing with them without even realizing it. But some of the capabilities are certainly expanding and it's getting baked into more and more services. And we think that's exciting, but alongside of it, I think we've been very vocal about where there are risks. And responsible AI is something that's been baked into Microsoft at an organizational layer for quite some time. And we've released a responsible AI standard in that space along with impact assessment templates to not only showcase how we provide instructions to engineering teams of the concerns that you need to take into account and some of the decisions you need to make, but then sharing that information with other organizations of how you would build such principles into your own organization and how you would engineer and innovate on these services. So some of the standard that, that we've released there and updated, um, it's, ways, it's ways that guides our development of the services that you mentioned. And it also is something that we're keen to share with others uh, to encourage the same type of behaviors. I think the transparency point is an interesting one because it, it used to be, and we talked about it even in the days of GDPR, transparency of algorithms. And I think people are well aware, I think, at least in policy discussions, of some of the limitations about transparency of algorithms. I think we can and should be transparent about the data that goes into that. I think we should be transparent about the limitations and the uses and the intended uses. And I think that's reflected both in the AI standard and across all of our AI platform services. So all of that is publicly available. We produce transparency notes because customers expect that to understand for all of our platform services, you know, what was the intended use, what type of limitations are into that. And I think it's a good example, if you look at it, to just remind, <laughs> remind ourselves of, you know, chat, chat GPT is not the only type of AI. You know, we have a lot of platform services that are really leveraged in that space. 
And transparency is something that we've implemented, as I said, across the standard, across the services, uh, and it's customer facing. It's also picked up in a policy context, and so transparency is not just around the algorithms, but transparency when users are interacting with these services. And you can imagine implications for that in the context of journalism and the like, where you want to make sure if content has been produced by an AI system without any human input, I think there's a fair transparency expectation around that. And there are exciting standards that are emerging with watermarks and the like to be able to identify that. Um, we talk a lot about deep fakes and some of the potential threats that, that can present. I think there's already work underway that we're a part of and others are a part of to develop tools to help identify and be more transparent, not just when you're interacting with an AI system, but when you're interacting with content produced by an AI system. So you could do an entire conference on transparency alone in the context of AI. I think the Parliament and, well, the European Commission, of course, but the Parliament and Council have also picked up on that. Um, a lot of the rules started at very much the application layer. Uh, the transparency requirements certainly apply there. Now we're having more discussions about the transparency that can be introduced at even the foundation model layer, at least if you look at the Parliament's texts. And they've been very ambitious with that. I mean, you can talk about the transparency of environmental impacts and uh, IP trained material. You do run into you know, some of the technological challenges about how much transparency if you want to provide transparency in all the code that was used or all the data that was used to train the model. You know, in some instances, you're going to be looking at millions and millions and millions of line of code. How usable is that? How helpful is that? Does it have competitive implications? And I think those are where some of the discussions might focus. But we certainly, certainly share the view that we need to be transparent about this for our customers so they understand what they're using and where the limitations might be and what it was intended for in the first instance. I think we need to be transparent on the side of customers who are interfacing, you know, consumers, if you want to think about it that way, interfacing with AI systems and uh, AI produced content. And the more transparent we can be, the more assured our customers will be in using the services. I think the more trust they'll be in that system as well. But it's both on not just the data and the algorithm side and maybe some of the, the machine learning aspects that does get very hard to maybe understand. And you could be super transparent. I'm not sure I would even understand some of the transparency the engineering teams might be able to provide. But we double down on the point I made around transparency and the limitations, transparency of the usage, transparency when you're interfacing with these services and this type of AI produced content. I think that's going to be increasingly important, especially when you're thinking about it in the context of you know, implications for democracy and elections and the like. It's going to only pick up steam, I think, uh, over the next year. Um, so that's the way we've looked at it. I think some of the same debates that you had in your GDPR days, you see that at the technological layer. There are some competitive implications, so it's transparency perhaps for authorities versus transparency for all. We can get into some of those discussions. But by and large, I think it's something we've picked up in our standard. We've picked up on the importance of it for customers and the importance of it for society. And it comes down to also some of the auditing that can go into that and the third-party assessments that can be done to understand more about these systems and ensure the fairness that links to that as well in some of the outcomes. So in a shorter way, it's it's not been missed, you know, it's not been missed. And I think it's been picked up in some of the official contributions that we've tried to make to that space. If you look at even recent announcements for where we see global regulation needing to go and align, some of it's been picked up in Europe. They're way ahead in that space. But the recommendations that we would have for other jurisdictions uh, also include some of the requirements that you've introduced around transparency. Thank you. And uh, the issues that, that you pose uh, uh, around uh, the existing regulation as well, like GDPR, privacy, and so forth, definitely a uh, very important uh, aspect. And uh, I'm, I'm looking, of course, uh, as our representative from uh, the European Commission, uh, because those taps in exactly in the kind of uh, system of regulations that have been set up in order to uh, to cope with these new uh, uh, challenges, uh, to a certain extent, uh, if I may, th there is also like a, a step forward uh, with the way uh, the generative AI and and other technology, as you say, this is not just about ChatGPT and, and natural language processing, but it's much wider than that, potentially. Um, so there is there is a little bit of a chicken and egg uh, situation, uh, if I may say, uh, for the regulators, which is on one hand how much uh, it's possible to uh, to see with a crystal ball in the future and and 
uh, and basically be able to regulate things ex ante, uh, and how, how much of the things can be regulated uh, uh, with the current technology and the current knowledge that we have of the technology. So I, I guess this is like a big dilemma, also because uh, the, 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 main, uh, the main goal for, for the institutions are uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, to gather regulations for the benefits of, um, of, 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 uh, of the citizens uh, in the first place, uh, but also not hampering the innovation that can happen on the other side. So I suppose that this is not a very easy task, and uh, uh, we, we recently had the AI uh, Act, which, uh, which I think uh, tried or is trying to be a, a step in the direction of uh, all these challenges, th and I would like to ask uh, uh, Gabriele uh, to, to give us a bit of um, uh, his own take on these sets of questions, but seen from uh, the regulator perspective and uh, what's going on in the institutions at the moment. Uh, wait, I need to... then I should say this is in Spanish, so shall I, do you have a... Okay. Yeah, so basically indeed, um, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll use a little bit of the Swiss time to give you an overview of, of, the, of the AI Act that's been proposed. Of course, this is just the proposal of the Commission. As was correctly said, now we are way beyond that. Although there are certainly a number of issues on which um, both the Council and the Parliament are converging. So next, um, just uh, next, just the way of background, the I Act actually was not uh, did not come out out of nothing in April 2021. That was the time when the proposal was submitted by the Commission. The Commission had already worked on uh, the policy implications of AI for quite some time before. Um, here, for instance. I just mentioned the white paper on AI, which was uh, produced uh, in 2020, but the first communication on, on AI was in 2018. So in fact, the communication, uh, the first communication was 2018, which went to a high level expert group. So AI has been in the works in the commission from a policy standpoint for quite some time. And the AI Act is the result of all that previous work. Now, why the AI white paper? The white paper is important because it launched a wide consultation. And therefore, the AI Act, when it came out, already took into account uh, this consultation launched with the White Paper, where the Commission identified sort of what could be possible versus the options in terms of indeed how do we solve this dilemma that was mentioned right now to regulate the technology that's moving fast, regulate in such a way to protect the interests we want to protect, like safety, fundamental rights, but at the same time not hampering innovation. And so we consulted extensively. The, the report is actually available. Um, next, uh, next slide. So, and in this consultation, one of the findings was that there was a very large, um, very large um, consensus on the fact that there are a number of risks related to safety and risk of fundamental rights which need to be addressed, <coughs> and also that the current EU regulation may have some value. Uh, so, quite a high percentage of the respondents mentioned that. And so this led us to indeed uh, came up with uh, with uh, the AI Act. Next slide. Uh, next. So here I'll give you a bit of a snapshot of some of the key characteristics. We don't have a lot of time. Um, so, but an essential concept is that essentially the AI Act is not the only legislation applicable to AI. Uh, the AI Act covers a certain gap in EU legislation, notably as regards the requirements and obligations that the AI system needs to comply with before they are placed on the market. So in fact, the AI Act, what we call it is a product legislation. So it establishes requirements for the placing on the market of put into service of AI systems. And this is pretty much aligned with other EU legislation, like for instance, on medical devices or on machinery or toys, like medical device already today, even outside the AI Act can have AI can be AI systems and are assessed under the medical device regulation. But the medical device regulation, for instance, doesn't contain specific requirements on the AI component. 
that is where the IR comes in. Um, and that's also why we decided to adopt this approach from a road perspective. Uh, but as I said, there is certainly other legislation that applies. Data protection was mentioned earlier on, consumer protection, equality law, uh, when you talk about the platforms, the DSA, DMA. So certainly the I Act is going to act as a complementary piece of legislation to all this already existing ecosystem of EU law. Um, an important concept is the risk-based approach. We'll talk about this in a second. And the level playing field between EU and non-EU players. So the I Act applies to the products or the I system that are placed on the EU market, that are sold on the European market, regardless of whether the manufacturer, the provider of those products is on EU based or non EU based. Next slide. So here I would say is perhaps one of the most important slides of the whole presentation. Uh, it's really this risk based approach. The idea is that we don't want to regulate the technology as such, so AI as such, but only want to regulate its use. And we want to regulate the use depending on the risk that it generates. So the higher the risk, the stricter the rules. That's why you have this pyramid and you have this risk-based approach. Um, we start from an acceptable situation and risk where essentially those type of AI practices or AI systems are outright prohibited because there is no source of value in allowing certain systems to be available on the market. The, the greatest majority of the provisions of the AI Act is about high risk. High risk, when a system is classified as high risk, it means that it is permitted but is subject to certain requirements, so it needs to comply with certain requirements and needs to comply with certain procedures before it's placed on the market. So it's a so-called conformity exception. Uh, and this applies to systems like, for instance, recruitment software, but also to AI systems that are safety components of products, like, for instance, safety component of a robot or of a medical device. The third category are those systems that pose what we call transparency risk in the sense that those systems do not warrant to comply with certain specific requirements on how they are developed, but rather they need to be disclosed. Um, an example is, for instance, a chatbot or a deepfake. Uh, and finally, the fourth category are not affected by the AI Act at all. So these are all systems that are not regulated by the AI Act, but with regard to which it may be possible for manufacturer to apply voluntarily certain requirements. So we only foresee the possibility of code of conduct for AI systems that are not classified as uh, prohibited, permitted, or, perm or, or so under the per first two layers. Next slide. Um, so here very briefly, there are four categories of prohibitions. You will see them on the slide. Um, all of them, there is only one, th the fourth one, so the real-time remote biometric identification systems in um, public access of spaces by law enforcement authorities, this is the only prohibition that has exceptions, meaning that the systems can actually be used under certain circumstances. As you may know, essentially here we're referring to specific type of systems used by law only by law enforcement authorities and only in certain circumstances, so public accessible spaces. This is where I can say there is certainly a lot of debate between the two institutions, very heated. Um, for instance, the Council has taken a position to align with the Commission proposal to allow those systems under certain conditions, whereas, for instance, the Parliament has decided to uh, ban those systems. And here, actually, sorry, I, meant, I forgot to mention, we're talking about real-time use of those systems, essentially um, live, as opposed to you can use those systems also on video feeds, but that's not what what our initial proposal was about. Next slide. Uh, the next category, as I mentioned, is the high risk. And here we have two major categories, two major big buckets. The first one is where the AI system is a safety component of a product. I mentioned before machinery, toys, uh, medical devices. So all these products, m I would say the greatest majority of products in the EU is subject already to what we call harmonization legislation. That's why you have a machinery directive, a toy directive, a medical device directive, and, and so on. But none of those instruments specifically relate to, say, components related to digital. So certainly not on AI. And this is where the AI Act comes in. So the AI Act would apply 
to AI systems that are used as a safety element of those products to the extent uh, the product is subject to the strictest uh, conformity assessment procedures. So essentially, as you can see, the risk classification of the AI system is linked to the risk classification of the actual product to which the AI system serves as a safety component. That's the first category of high-risk AI systems. The second category is the one that you see related to the MSP. It covers eight areas, eight quite broad areas, but not the whole area is high risk. Only the systems that are specifically listed under each area. The reason for that is because, first of all, not even law enforcement, which may certainly be considered a sensitive area, doesn't mean that certainly necessarily that all AI systems used by law enforcement authorities are high risk because some system may be used just for the purpose of uh, you know, not tasks that are not necessarily high risk. So we wanted to enable essentially here a system whereby um, the commission would be able to add use cases as technology develops, use case develops. So that is why you have this distinction between the area, those areas listed there. Uh, but if you look at the Annex C, in fact, you see under each area another list, a more specific list. And that is the list to which the AI Act applies. So the systems that are high risk are those listed under each of those areas. And as I mentioned, the idea was to ensure also the future-proofness of the framework and to allow this the, the Commission to update those lists. Next slide. Here we, we go a little bit on touching on something that was already mentioned. So what happens when a system is high risk? The AI system needs to comply with certain requirements. And the requirements here, we have not been particularly creative or inventive. We have aligned here a lot, we have relied a lot on the work of a high level expert group. But generally, these are principles that are quite universally uh, agreed upon. So that AI systems need to comply with good data quality, uh, need to be documented, and also there must be systems to ensure the traceability, the transparency we just mentioned, notably vis-a-vis um, the user or the deployer, ensure what are the capabilities and limitations of the system. Human oversight, this is a very important element for uh, trustworthy AI system and human-centric AI system, so there should always be possibility to have a human oversight. And then robustness, accuracy, and cybersecurity. So again, these are the, le the five requirements that we have identified in which there is a large consensus, and certainly I can confirm even the, the two co-legislators have agreed with this structure. Next slide. Um, I think we can skip that in the interest of time, uh, but just to say that, of course, there is uh, the requirements of the system are then coupled with this number of obligations based on the type of actors in the value chain. Um, third category, transparency obligations. Here there are three use cases. The first one is, uh, we believe it's, it's a fundamental human right or, or human dignity to know whether you're interacting with an AI system or with a human. That is the, the reason, the rationale of the first provision, that people need to be informed that they are interacting with a machine unless this is obvious from a description summary. One use case is certainly a chatbot. For instance, on internet where you have a pop-up, this is actually quite common to say, hey, I'm a chatbot and so on. Second use case is emotion recognition and biometric categorization systems. We believe also in those, ca those type of system cases, people need to be informed. Here there is some political disagreement. For instance, the, the parliament actually proposed some ban on those systems, a ban on those systems. And finally, the third uh, use case is about uh, what was mentioned before, a bit the transparency vis-a-vis -vis the content produced by the AI system. Notably, when those con that content can actually lead to some sort of deception, like a deep fake video or, or so on. Uh, next slide. Uh, just two words about the governance. Um, there will be a governance system at national level and at European level. We can move directly to the next one, to remove the European level, that's perhaps more interesting. 
So the enforcement of EU law is primarily dev devoted to the national authorities. So the AI Act, the enforcement of the AI Act will rest on the enforcement of the national authorities, but we wanted to foresee a mechanism for European coordination. <coughs> That's the proposal of having the AI Board. The AI Board shall basically put together um, all the national authorities of the member states with the goal to ensure a coherent application of the regulation across the EU. Um, the board will also allow for the possibility to have subgroups, for instance, for inviting experts, for discussing per particular topics or examining specific questions. And the board will also see the presence of the commission, which acts as a secretary, and the European Data Protection Supervisor, which essentially serves the role of the authority supervising the application of the AI Act vis-a-vis the EU institutions. So EU institutions, like the Commission, for instance, can also become provider of the system if we develop a, a system in-house, that could be the high risk, or users if we buy it on the market. In that case, we would also need an authority supervising our compliance with the AI Act. Next slide. So here is really the, the last two slides. This is where essentially the process, most of you I guess are familiar, the Commission made the proposal in April 2021. The Council reached this position in December last year, um, so-called general approach, it's, the, it's negotiation position, and the Parliament just did it uh, very recently. And now we are in the phase of starting trilogues. The first trilogue already took place uh, last, last week. Uh, the same day the Parliament adopted this position was so-called handshake trilogue, where essentially the three institutions got together and um, uh, sort of mm, manifested their position. It was not really a sort of substantive discussion. But the next trial is gonna happen uh, on the 18th of July uh, and uh, under the auspices of the uh, new presidency, the Spanish presidency. These are political trilogues. Uh, at the same time, there will be a lot of technical trilogues, so-called technical trilogues, so essentially, the services of the three institutions will get together to prepare for the political trilogues taking place. Um, the hope is that we will finalize the act by the end of the year under the Spanish presidency. That's their commitment, and so also the parliament is very committed to finalize the act then. Last slide, next point, is about the timeline. Um, once the, the act will be adopted on an agreement between parliament and council, it will enter into force uh, after 15 days, but we foresee a period of transition. So the commission has proposed a period of transition of three years to make sure that, um, like it happened in GDPR, uh, companies and market operators have time to adjust to this new uh, rule. And in parallel also, uh, there will be uh, a mandate for the technical European organizations, so-called uh, European standardization organizations like SEN, Semilec, and ETSI, to develop harmonized standards. The harmonized standards are part of the governance of the AI Act in the sense that they provide technical specifications to operationalize the requirements that I just mentioned, like transparency, data, human oversight, and so on. So I'll leave it here and have some questions. Thank you, thank you, Gabriele. I'm pretty sure that uh, there might be some specific questions afterwards on uh, on your very interesting presentation. Uh, and um, just in a nutshell, I mean, what what you uh, what you presented uh, is definitely one part of the puzzle, which is the regulator point of view. But uh, uh, in in this whole uh, constellation, there is a multitude of actors. Which uh, uh, which n are operating in, in this. I mean, we we've seen the the corporate sector on one side, seen the consumers and the citizens on the other side, uh, the research community and and so forth. Uh, and I would like to to call Peter in uh, to uh, uh, help me out with this uh, question of uh, of the cooperation between uh, between those those actors, because uh, obviously. Uh, the the legislative side and also like trying to to influence the legislative side is one aspect of it, uh, but there is also the aspect of more horizontal 
uh, cooperation in order to uh, deal with the complexity of the ethical issues uh, that uh, concerns the artificial intelligence. So Peter, the, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I'm really happy to be here with you to share some thoughts from an ethical perspective on this ethics topic. I mean, I'm an ethicist at the University of Lucerne, ethics professor, um, before I was a visiting fellow at Yale, focusing on the ethics of AI, um, the ethics of digital transformation. And I would like to start to address that question exactly by um, explaining shortly a little bit the role of ethics in the relation with law and in, in the pr process of policy making. Because it's actually a role of critical examination of the law itself, but also of policy making processes, if they are just legal or if they're even also legitimate. So um, we have to keep in mind that also a democratic opinion forming and decision making process can lead to results which are then, of course, legal if the democratic opinion forming decision making process was correct and fair, but still can be illegitimate results because maybe in the democratic process, one particular special interest was given more attention than another one due to overemphasized lobbying activities or financial resources, or just because the policymakers didn't have a holistic view on the issue, or even the possibility that we cannot foresee all the problems which can come out of a legislative process. So we try to do something good, but then in the end of the day, in reality, this brings in more injustice, for example. And the role of ethics as an academic discipline is actually to critically examine, be it the policymaking process itself regarding lobbying, special interest representation, but also then laws which are in place if they are still keeping up to ethical standards. And if I may use the opportunity of this panel to enter not just with a theoretical lecture, but rather with interacting with what's uh, already been said. I think, you know, from an ethical perspective, um, I welcome what Microsoft is doing regarding responsible AI. What I wish, though, and uh, I know that's going to be a little bit provocative, but that's the reason I think we are here on a, on a round table to be able to discuss this, is I would love to see less Sunday morning preaching but more actions during the week. What I mean by that is, and I'm not referring it now on Microsoft specifically, but generally on multinational tech companies, that we have to keep also focusing on the ongoing human rights violations, which are not negative side effects, but rather core business model elements of certain kind of business models. And we have to keep focusing on that and we have to try to tackle them in a way which then at the end of the day is really making a difference in real life where users are protected in their human rights, where people are protected as citizens of democracies that they're not manipulated during opinion forming and decision making processes, but rather influenced. What is the difference between manipulation and influence? When I walk on the street and I see a political campaign ad, it is expectable from a human being to critically understand, okay, now I'm influenced by this campaign. Now, online, in the digital sphere, it's a total different thing because there's such amount of data of myself that AI does know myself better than I do. And put it in imagery, it is possible for so-called AI to play exactly the piano, the way that and trigger things that I as a consumer buy the products AI wants me to buy or that I vote in the way AI wants me to vote. And that's manipulation because humans cannot understand anymore that they are manipulated because of behavioral patterns which are being analyzed based on big data of them. And there I think more action is needed um, in order to protect the human right to democracy, the human right to participate politically in opinion forming decision making process without being manipulated but rather based on freedom, based on autonomy um, of, of humans which are actually protected by human rights and we fought as humanity, we fought for centuries for these rights so we need to take care 
of them even now in this digital transformation and use of AI period. Now, so that's important also regarding, you know, the, the potential negative potential of fake news, the uh, negative potential of deep fakes. I think we are not taking enough seriously these potentials and, and we need to take them seriously because we're really running down, if not, we're really running down democracies as such and risking that there will not be any democracies anymore on this planet if we're not getting things done. Um, now, how can we get things done? Um, from an ethical perspective, I would suggest that you should um, work with so-called human rights-based database systems. Let me start with database systems. Why do I refer to database systems rather to, rather to, um, um, to AI? Um, if you look at AI, what it's actually able to do is surpassing human capabilities in certain dom domains of human intelligence. Mm. So for example, in calculation, logical deduction, working with a huge amount of data. But if you consider other domains of human intelligence, I would argue, I would even go so far to say it's not only not reachable for AI today, but it won't be reachable in the future either. I refer to emotional intelligence, I refer to social intelligence, I refer to more capability. Let me give you some examples for these three domains where I would argue that they are not reachable for so-called AI. Let's take a healthcare robot. I can tell that robot, look, if the patient is crying, please cry as well. Mm? And the patient and the robot will perform that perfectly or almost perfectly. But no one would say the robot really feels emotions. It just follows the rules. You know, I can give the same robot the rule, listen, if the patient starts to cry, kick him or her. And the robot will do that in the exact perfect way as well. It would just follow the rule. Now this example allows me to show not only that emotional and social intelligence is hard to reach, if not even impossible to reach, but it allows me also, the same example allows me also to show that also the ethical quality of a rule is not accessible for a robot. So the robot kicking that crying patient isn't aware of the fact that this is an illegitimate act. It just follows the rule. You know, take a self-driving car. I could tell the car, listen, I need to go as fast as possible to the train station, but please don't do harm to humans. And the self-driving car would respect that rule is able, from an ethical point of view, to perform an ethically sound action following rules. Now, I could also tell the exactly same self-driving car, listen, I'm really late, although I come from Switzerland, I'm really late, Please bring me to the station as soon as possible, whatever costs they are. And the self-driving car would perform that action again in the exactly same perfect way because it's not able to understand, listen, that's a limit I shouldn't cross. What I of course you would expect from a human driver saying, listen, um, I know you're gonna lose your train, but it's not, it's, it's, that's not more important than um, not killing people. So what I'm referring to is moral capability. So I would say that also um, so-called AI is not able to morally understand what is ethically required from us, what are the ethical principles, what are the actual ethical norms, what humans are. We don't have to be dictated in what are the ethical principles and rules we need to follow, but we are able, based on our freedom, to choose between ethically right and wrong, good and bad, and set up rules ourselves. That's the core meaning of autonomy, um, that we are able to set up rules ourselves from an ethical point of view. And that would be another domain where I would say it's not reachable for so-called AI. Therefore, I would rather refer to it as database systems because at the end of the day, at the core of what we see right now in this variety of systems is data, data, data. That's the core. And there you see also the importance to introduce human rights-based database systems in order to make sure 
that that data is protected in order to protect freedom. I know that all of us, we're kind of getting used to the fact that our privacy and our data protection is violated on a daily basis, but we shouldn't. Mm. If I use, let's say, a teaching assistance tool of Microsoft, I don't understand why we cannot make that product profitable without violating my human right to data protection and privacy. Why does it have to collect my data in a way which is violating human rights? And that's the reason why I'm calling for human rights-based database systems. Now, I welcome what, the, um, what on the European level has been done so far, because it's actually, I think, a good example how the fundamental rights, human rights of people, are given more priority than business interests of some multinational tech corporations. That's very positive from an ethical point of view. I think now looking at the proposal concretely, which was now a week, you know, even more, more than a week ago, um, you know, um, decided by the, the European Parliament, I think there are two things which I hope will be still, um, you know, developed further. One is um, that it is more accessible for citizens to defend themselves against violations of their rights by database systems that they can be represented by professional organizations and not to do have to do that by themselves because of course that's difficult for certain vulnerable groups to really get these rights in place. And I think the other thing is the exception which has been done or has been included on um, people which are fleeing from other countries or in migration processes. Um, there shouldn't be these exceptions because it's gonna be hard to uh, legitimate that from a human rights perspective. Now, finalizing my, um, my comments, um, I think we have, although recognizing what on the European level has been done so far, I think, and I would, would be very grateful if we could move to the next slide, it's gonna be my last one, um, that we need um, also to address these global issues on a global level. And therefore, I call for the establishment of an international database systems agency at the UN, where the cooperation between countries, companies, civil society actors can be fostered, where the peaceful use of database systems is put forward, where human rights-based database systems are put forward, where sustainability is put in the focus of this technology-based process because we have to keep in mind ICT is one of the last industry sectors where we have a growing CO2 emission. So we need to we need to address that. And I think the way we should do it is by an international database systems agency either at the UN. If you think now okay this is the ethicist dreaming, um, let me remind you that we have an analogy here where humanity was able in human history to tackle a technology-based progress in a way in order to save humanity and the planet. I refer to nuclear technologies, very simply put, we have done research first, then we have created the atomic bomb, third, we have dropped it several times, and then fourth, we understood we need to do something about it in order to avoid the worse. Of course, I'm aware of the geopolitical implications. I'm aware of the fact that this is not a perfect solution, but at least we have to admit we were able to avoid the worse. And therefore, I would say we should go in the same direction with IDA, with the International Database Systems Agency, in order to more precisely be able to identify the ethical positive potential and focus on that and promote that and also to identify very precisely the ethical risks and then really focus on them in avoiding them and mastering them. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Peter. This is like very good food for thought uh, and uh, brings us a bit more on another dimension of the conversation uh, which, uh, which couples the challenge of this uh, of this uh, of this discussion between uh, really more, uh, I would say, uh, uh, 
down to heart uh, regulatory aspects uh, what's happening with uh, with the business but also what's happening with human minds and how this is affecting uh, the ethics on on a broader level uh, so I I'm pretty sure that we're going to have uh, some reactions uh, to to this in, uh, in 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 some minutes when I will open the floor to uh, conversation but before um, before that, I would like to ask uh, uh, Ni Nicolas uh, to come back to one of my first questions of uh, uh, when I started uh, my introduction, especially mentioning uh, mentioning the the question about the dilemma that we have both uh, uh, at uh, at the institutional level, but also uh, at the consumers' levels, at citizens' citizens levels, and so on, which is the trade-off between uh, uh, basically the need to protect, the need to uh, take into consideration all these ethical uh, aspects, but also on the other hand, the need to uh, continue to innovate, continue to experiment, to continue to advance the technology itself. Uh, how can it be ensured that uh, uh, you know, we can address on one side the risks and the ethical concerns, which we, we just uh, heard from from Gabriele and and Peter and then on the other high uh, side the, the 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 fact that AI, AI uh, these concerns are not going to hamper research and development and innovation and I have a challenge now which is trying to to bring to bring the the, the microphone as far as ah you're going to get uh, a wireless mic that's perfect thanks so much is that work yeah wow thank you very much for the for 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 the privilege, like it's, it's really interesting to have to have heard all of this. Oh, is, is it okay? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. It, it's really uh, interesting to have to have listened to to all of these questions. Like I will address your questions in the fair, but like yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion actually, like to to pick up on this uh, IBA uh, modeled after IAEA, um, the like th this provocation about Microsoft's lobbying and like of course like uh, uh, Gabriel is like you know presenting where we started two years ago uh, yeah a, a long time so all of this is uh, is very good food for thought um and uh yeah so i'll, I'll make it i'll make it short uh, your question Giuseppe, uh, about the trade-off between uh, innovation and uh and, and responsibility or like uh, in in uh, the eu jargon perhaps like trustworthiness versus excellence right uh, it's always been something that i i uh, i quite misunderstand uh, th th there is a bit of a, of a false dichotomy here, and as, as Jeremy mentioned, right, like the trust in the technology by the consumers, by the de deployers of it, is necessary uh, in order to, to, to start having a market that actually uh, uh, is, is profitable enough, is, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is juicy enough for you to even attempt to innovate uh, for it, right? So, so we do have uh, a, a couple of measures in the uh, in the AI Act and, and beyond the AI Act in order to facilitate uh, kind of like this this uh, uh, having both innovation and trustworthiness, like uh, ex excellence and trustworthiness in the uh, in the EU, right? And uh, some of these mechanisms are, are, are fairly uh, uh, common. So this notion of regulatory sandboxes, where you could actually like uh, have a, a sort of like test uh, in, in real life conditions uh, on the market of your AI systems uh, without especially having uh, uh, you know fully like uh, finished the product uh, in a way perhaps even that some some people are suggesting at a very early stage in the development having already a form of like close to a partnership uh, with uh, with some extra regulatory scrutiny because you are not following the, the usual pathway of the law but uh, with a certain freedom to see whether your product can can uh, can innovate as well right so regulatory sandboxes are uh, one one of the um, one of the ways uh, uh, where innovation and, and uh, um, like risk mitigation has been have been brought in uh, there are many things that I think could be done in order to to foster this uh, I do think like if we are looking into the uh, into into AI right like the industrial policy uh, element of uh, of AI and digitalization has always been uh, perhaps missing right it's 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 uh, it's been uh, uh, something where like if you want a, a good uh, a good technological landscape, a, a well-governed technology. You not only need the, the stick, let's say, uh, you also need the carrot uh, for for industry. And I think like right now we, we do have the regulations, which is like 
a very uh, a very soft uh, stick, uh, but then you've got the, the the carrot that is missing, which would be perhaps like a, a Horizon Europe uh, uh, investment in some research, perhaps to facilitate compliance uh, with the AI Act. Because what what we have to understand is that these high risk areas that have been uh, that have been mentioned are also high impact areas, right? So education. Uh, migration, uh, uh, public services, right? It's extremely important to get it right. The risks are real and the technology so far, like it's not ready to be, uh, to, to guarantee a, an absence of biases. It's not, the, the technology is not ready to guarantee uh, that like the chatbot is not all of a sudden going to uh, mislead you and hallucinate or something like that if you use a chatbot in, in uh, public services. But imagine how useful it will be for the public to actually have a, a, a public administration that has uh, AI-enabled public ad administration, right? So by high impact, I really mean that this is something that like society should probably invest into to make to develop very trustworthy, like extremely robust, accurate, and and secure uh, AI systems. Uh, that can be deployed in this very high risk area. And right now, one of the fear uh, that that we have is that like a lot of the of the, uh, the SMEs uh, in the in the EU would actually uh, feel disincentivized to attempt uh, to 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 work in these high risk areas uh, in these um, in these sectors that are that are a lot more sensitive, like critical infrastructure, healthcare, medical devices. Um, and yet, this is where, like society, maybe have has the most, the highest willingness to pay for high-quality products, right? And that's something that uh, that we are perhaps missing. And this is why I'm very excited about the regulatory sandboxes as a way to to really, like, at least for the next like couple of years, um, uh, experiment a bit about, like, uh, to to quickly uh, iterate on the technology and, and adding technology that is a lot more reliable, right? So that's that's something like uh, uh, in terms of the. Uh, this distance between trustworthy and innovation, like mechanisms like this could be useful, and uh, the, the in particular for this high impact uh, area. Overall, right, like what we are looking at, I'm an economist by training, right, and, and, and what we are looking at here uh, in terms of like the trustworthiness and innovation, uh, in order for, for like hospitals or public administration to be confident that they can deploy uh, an AI system, right, they have to trust that the AI system will not uh, uh, will not be uh, uh, problematic, right? So we they, they 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 have to trust that this AI system will all of a sudden not not attempt to deceive or manipulate accidentally some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, patients in the hospital, right? And in order currently because the, there is such a big asymmetry of information between the buyer side and the user side, right? We actually have the the, the users like the uh, really unsure about whether the the AI system that they are being pitched is actually like high quality or low quality because of the lack of transparency that we touched upon at the very beginning, right? It's very difficult to interpret, to predict, and, and even to correct these AI systems once, once they are rolled out. These are very uh, difficult to, inter to interpret. So what we need, and thanks to this regulation, I think we are going there, is, is to have a, a, an easy way to signal whether your system is trustworthy uh, or not, is, is like therefore high quality or not, in order for, for the, the buyers to be a lot more confident that they can put they can pay like uh, 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 th these companies like tremendous amounts of money in order to get uh, to get the AI services that uh, that they'd like in the in the high risk area. And via the compliance with the regulation, you as a, as a as a provider of AI system, you demonstrate that you are building high quality system. So that's uh, that's one of the things that, uh, in my opinion, is a, is a fundamental principle to to enhance both like the trustworthiness, but also like incentivize like investment into high quality. Uh, uh, AI system, as opposed to the to the utter uh, nonsense that uh, we are seeing sometimes, like uh, released open source on uh, on those days, which is literally throwing data and compute together and see what happens, right? Which which is like uh, I mean, this has caused like this, this kind of open source uh, system, or like not about open source, right? It's not about the distribution channel. It's about the the fact that this is low quality AI made by made by people who, who do not have risk management system in place or quality management system in place or even basic risk. Uh, risk, uh, um, sorry, um, uh, robustness evaluations or anything like that. We have had uh, in Belgium, like uh, uh, back in March, somebody killing themselves after uh, uh, interacting with a, 
uh, with uh, with a chatbot uh, for uh, for like six weeks, right? And this is something like this is probably just the tip of the iceberg. There are plenty of people that are currently falling in love with chatbots all over the internet. Chatbots that have not been going through a conformity assessment or any form of like guarantee that they are not currently suggesting to a bunch of these people to actually take drugs in order to feel better, to actually like uh, cheat on their husband or their wives in order to feel better and, and that kind of thing. This is something that is uh, not limited to uh, uh, people who don't care, right? Like we have seen also with Microsoft that like very sophisticated responsible AI standards can lead to kind of like uh, uh, kind of a failed product launch. We have seen with Bard in Google failed product launch, right, as well about, about this AI system. This is due to something else than just like seeing what happened. It's just, it's, this is due to the market pressure, right, and the race like where we hear like some of perhaps your more senior colleague, right, like uh, saying that we're going to make Google dance and this kind of behavior a bit of a, uh, of a race, uh, yeah, literal like a, a race to like being the first one to have the biggest model out there and to capture this, uh, capture as much market share as possible, right, in, in, in this thing. Is this is unhealthy behavior. And I do think that, you know, for all the things that I, that I disagree with the EU AI Act and, right, like there, there is at least, uh, this is bringing us back to a more, a more uh, um, sensible uh, approach to, to, to this technology. So I'll, I'll stop here for now. I, I do have, I, I would love to talk a lot more, but like this is, the discussion is more important in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, Nicolas. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for, for these uh, incredible fruitful thoughts. And uh, obviously now is the time to uh, open the discussion. I'm pretty sure that there are some interesting questions uh, from, uh, from your side. Uh, so without no further ado, uh, we still have uh, not too much, but we have a good uh, 10, uh, 15 minutes uh, for, yeah, 5.30, 5.30 I've, I've been told, 6.30, that's going to be a little bit more challenging, I would say, <laughs> we're going to ask ChatGPT to... <laughs> I would say let's see how how the questions uh, goes and and I'm pretty sure that uh, we we can take it from there. So I we 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 have some time for for the questions. So would like to open the floor for first reactions uh, on uh, on those uh, interesting uh, uh, remarks that we just heard. And uh, I don't know who would like to break the ice. Hi, um, thank you for this. Um, my name is Vasilis Dusas. I am the head of European operations at the Alliance for Securing Democracy, an initiative of the German Marshall Fund. The question I have, and it's very specific, is how future-proof this legislative and other initiatives, this set of initiatives are. And I say this because um, my bread and butter, my everyday work has to do with foreign interference, information manipulation, Russia, China, utilizing existing technologies, existing the existing landscape to sway elections, uh, to append processes, to fuel polarization in our societies, to shape uh, opinions and public discourse. Of course, I commend the commission for starting earlier the EU is the first block that aims to do that in a very tangible way to regulate how AI um, shapes or sh is shaped uh, by our societies. Uh, this was done in record speed by European standards. It's substantive, it's action oriented, um, but it might not be enough. And before we get to the point where we're talking about the AI takeover, mm, uh, that almost sci-fi scenario, which I want to agree with Peter, um, but I, I fear my inner op uh, pessimism guides me to believe that it will come sooner rather than later. I think the biggest fear for our democracies is right now when AI will become better, more refined, and human intelligence will also become better as to, why to, har as to how to harness AI. So the real danger of our democracies lies there, you know, when real people mm, sitting <coughs> in <coughs> countries outside, but also inside, will learn how to use AI better. Mm. Uh, people are already perplexed uh, um, 
by what's out there, and that's information manipulation, there's attacks to election integrity, there's use of emerging tech, and so on and so forth. That's before you throw in generative AI. And I'm wondering how future-proof this framework is. It can't solve everything, I understand that. I fully appreciate that you're not superhuman uh, there. But there is this uh, concern that no matter what is done, will continue being at the back of, uh, of our minds. Um, and I say this very specifically because I fear some of the models, some of the expectations we have will become redundant very, very soon. Um, the best case is what happened since, uh, you uh, since you presented the proposal. Um, it was after the proposal that generative AI uh, came into being in such a public fashion. And it all but shaped, uh, reshaped uh, the terms of the discussion, the terms of engagement. And um, Sorry, this was a comment and somewhere in there there is a question hidden, so I hope you got that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, who would like to react first to to this? <laughs> Looking on the on this side, <laughs> and I kept looking to the commission, but it's also a question for um, the private sector okay. as well. Thanks. I think your first question was how future proof. Listen, I don't think anyone expects that this will be the last piece of regulation that you know, touches upon the challenges or opportunities around AI. I think, on the one hand, you could argue that. There are principles. I mean, you consider that principles or just regulations, and there's different regulatory cultures there that go into that. But you're going to see case law emerge. You're going to see new challenges emerge. I think you're going to see new challenges emerge from some of the regulation as such. I, you could argue that a lot of the regulation made in Brussels is addressing problems caused by other regulations. So you, it's not going to be future proof in that sense. I just think it's impossible. I do think some of the principles, though, are the same ones we've been dealing with before, whether it's privacy principles, competition, intellectual property. Uh, you can always go down that list. There are some new challenges here, and the speed is pretty impressive. Um, and again, I, I, I think I, I would even go so far as to say if sometimes I can think of even more negative challenges and risks and fears in this space, but I, I still am a bit op more optimistic than some of the other speakers I, I've heard. I, I think this will happen quickly. But it is because of the guardrails that we're putting in place where there will be limits on the car example where that car will not be able to get you to the hospital, all things considered, because it won't be trained that way. Um, it wouldn't be allowed. There would be too many checks and balances there to prevent that. And I think for all the concern, and there will be misuse of this technology, I think we're actually you know, very concerned about that, and that kind of underpins the calls for much of this regulation. There's also going to be you know, defensive possibilities. If you think of cybersecurity, there's a lot of ways that nefarious actors are going to leverage these technologies that would, yeah, absolutely have election implications, it'll have democratic implications, it'll have criminal implications. But we're also gonna come up with more exciting ways, I think, to detect those type of attacks. It's a cat and mouse game like it always is, you know, in many other senses. But I think you can look at both the opportunity for AI to serve as defensive capabilities and even some of the work that we've done with Ukraine and elsewhere you know have leveraged AI for exactly some of those purposes you know in some instances it's more even tracking cultural heritage destruction and holding world criminals to account and use leveraging AI to track some of that in the crisis in Ukraine at the moment but in the cybersecurity context even more broadly than that looking at the way that some of these new technologies can be used to defend against and predict and assess where these attacks are coming from it doesn't mean that the the bad guys won't also have their ways of doing it. But generative AI is such, I think you know, that's where we get back to the data that this is being created, right? And that is more some of what we talked about earlier, um, fake news, deep fakes, uh, legitimacy of that. I think the, the broader answer is still one of education around this and some of that literacy that would need to go into it. You know, I think those who are going to be most successful at this are not those that are most familiar just with the tools, but familiar with how the tool came to that, the type of questions you would ask. So it's gonna be a lot of experience here that goes into who wins the most with AI. Um, there are a lot of competitive juices there, and I think you mentioned that. I think that's understandable given where the opportunity is. Um, it does lead to mistakes sometimes, but I think it's exactly why you know, the EU is leading in this space, and I think there's still some nuance and elements of the EU AI Act that'll be under discussion. But I, I'm a little bit more optimistic than that, and I just think 
we try to focus as much on the the opportunities here. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you. To yeah. If I may shortly, because you were referring to the optimism and pessimism. I think I'm, I'm pessimistic as you regarding the fact that there is not the, th I mean the question is not if there will be misuse. I think the question is what kind of misuse is happening right now? What has been happening since 10, 20 years? You're getting used to and how we are getting this in place again. You know, I'm referring again to human rights violations of data protection of privacy. Um, I'm referring also to the fact that, you know, I mean, all this hype about generative AI. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, coming from Switzerland is nothing than a cow, you know, rechewing what humans have already created. And the humans, there's some humans living from that. And they were protected by intellectual property rights, which are now violated on a daily basis, and no one cares about it. Instead, there are some companies making billions out of it. And we are watching this, so we're not talking about there will be misuses. We're talking about the fact that part of that digital transformation and the use of database systems of so-called AI, and we have, to f we have to face that in order to be able then to address it. So that's my pessimistic part, that, that the part I share with you, but out of this pessimism comes the urgency to do something about it. So like the EU is, is trying to do, but also what is then bringing the idea of AIDA up there, and there my optimism comes into the game, because there I would say, Looking what we were able, referring to nuclear technologies, also there, the idea at the beginning of an IAEI, the International Atomic Energy Agency, wasn't happiness around the planet. I mean, there was a lot of, you know, opposition by industries, by states against this idea, and still humanity was able to establish that. And this idea is picking up. Um, at the end of May, the elders, that's a group of, former global leaders, um, founded by Nelson Mandela. Nowadays, Ban Ki-moon is part of that, Mary Robinson. Um, they have actually took up these two concrete proposals, human rights-based database systems, um, as you see the results of a multi-year research project of myself, started at Yale University, finished now at the University of CERN. They picked up both concrete options, uh, um, suggestions, and said, listen, we need to do that. We urge member states of the UN to establish such an agency in analogy to the Ato International Atomic Energy Agency. And also the present UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, also in its last policy brief um, at the beginning of June, said, listen, we need to build up such an institution and we need to foster human rights-based database systems. So that makes me more optimistic that this will be happening sooner than later in order to be able to keep up to the proof, like the, fut the proof of future you were um, requesting, and I think it was a legitimate request um, to, to, call, to call for that. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if someone else would like to add anything on this Perhaps specific. Perhaps briefly, I yeah. think. I'm Since there was <laughs> a, you were also called into the. Sure. Um, I think certainly this is something, the future proofness of the act that we have, uh, you know, I guess was one of our main concerns. I mean, when you decide to regulate this technology, uh, I mean, we knew that this is technology that evolves fast. So certainly this is something we had in mind since the beginning, and we have tried to use as much as flexibility we could within the framework that we had. Uh, I mean, you may know that, of course, um, there are certain rules on how you, you know, um, adopt secondary legislation, like regulations, directives, decisions, and so on, and certain different rules about the adoption, for instance, of um, called tertiary legislation, you know, commission executive powers, which are much faster, but are much more limited in scope. And for instance, you see examples in the, so the definition of AI, we decided to adopt the definition based on OCD, but with an annex, which gives OCD doesn't exist. An annex that can be updated by the Commission to implement an act. That was the idea behind the future proofness of the AI definition, making sure that we have tools to update the definition as the technology evolves. The second important aspect is what I mentioned before, is the update of the high-risk rules, for instance. Even there, indeed, 
uh, we want to make sure to, to, to use as much flexibility as possible for the Commission to be able to expand. Now the Council even said reduce the scope of the I Act as regards the, the classification of high risk. Um, so these are just two examples where we felt we could use the tools we have to make it future proof. Um, is it enough? Um, I don't know. I think that's the best we could do at the time. Um, but specifically on the point of the generative AI, I also want to mention that. Um, so the Commission took as, as a basis the UACD definition uh, of 2019, and it's still basically the center of the debate between the policy stakers. Um, but we made some adjustments. So one or two of the I Act, and the second one was adding content as the output. So if you read the, to compare our definition with the OECD definition, we say an AI system that can generate content such as, so output such as, content, recommendations of actions and decisions. The OECD doesn't mention content. And we did that specifically to cover generative AI. And we also foresee a pursuit in rules for generative AI, the ones I mentioned in transparency and ICT2. It's not as extensive as some are arguing today, because for instance, someone today are arguing that there should be, as, mentioned, as was mentioned before, um, watermarking for all AI-generated content, including text. We limited our transparency obligations on audio, video, and sound. Um, and in the circumstances in, this in which this, this content can actually um, generate um, deception because it resembles a uh, existing person situation so on so there are some some elements that constrain the, obli the obligation of transparency and it's an obligation on the user so I felt there we certainly put in place something one may argue it may not be enough or it should be expanded in scope it should be actually that obligation should be given not on the user but on the provider of the system this is where the debate is happening now but I think we, we saw that coming to some extent. Um, and finally, on the question around um, question manipulation and misinformation, these are absolutely very important issues that are also partly linked to the generative AI part, but more generally. There again, also, we made the choice to um, rely on what already exists. That is why the DSA was adopted just a few months before. The DSA for us is the key instrument to address issues around misinformation, illegal content online. Why? Because essentially the DSA tackles the propagation of the misdata. And so looks at the scale, looks at the role of the platforms in, in, in um, on the online space. Whereas the AI Act, as I mentioned before, is a product legislation. So it tackles the, the, the origin of and so the, the product. Um, so the two also need to be seen together. And um, for us, it's important to ensure that there is this common space. That doesn't mean, of course, that the act is perfect, it will not be approved, and we certainly open to, uh, to see what the Council and Parliament uh, are reflecting on. Um, but certainly, I mean, as you mentioned, you know, we are also human, and we've tried certainly our best, and um, I think we have tried to be as, as future-proof as, as we could. I would like to <laughs> extend the continuation of this to, to the others. I'm pretty sure that maybe you had more questions. I'm looking at the other people in the room. Look, Nicola. Just adding to that on the um, so the future proofness that Gabriel has, has, has provided quite a bit, but like I think something that we haven't asked ourselves uh, as well is like you know like uh, in order to prevent some of the concerns there like uh, it, it would be like the uh, inclusiveness and I think for that um, yeah I mean if even though today might not be a, a best example of this like it, there is an advisory forum being proposed in the uh, in the Parliament version that could help on this and that's actually something that originally like consultation of stakeholders was very much taken into account to at least like have as many antennas of problems that could occur in society right 
Uh, and then as a third point, besides so future-proofness, inclusiveness, and then uh, as a third point, I think like we first have to ask ourselves, do we want this speed of, uh, of uh, we, we are taking the speed as a given here, right? Like it's, it's crazy when you see the, the, the evolution of these tools. Um, but like you know, the 2008 crisis felt very crazy as well for the for the years leading up to the, to to it. Like with the innovation that was innovation that was taking place in the financial industry at the time, the dot com bubble was also like extremely fast and extremely crazy. So we have to start also take agency over the uh, over that that speed, right? And and that's something where we shouldn't think that this is a given that like it's imposed upon us. This is there is currently um, a vacuum in in the governance which leads to such a uh, to such a speed which leads to 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 incredible like uh, market valuations and some some uh, some some of this behavior is I, I'm not saying that this is a bubble right there are there tangible value behind it but like the way at which it, it is being like uh, uh, it cannot be absorbed by by society uh, so easily so let's ask ourselves like is that the speed that we want and what can we do if we want to so it's not like market forces are not physical forces and therefore we can actually do something about it just but like i'd, I'd be curious to speak about it, like to hear a lot more from uh, from everyone on this like thoughts on on that question that uh, that has been asked or, or even beyond that um if you have views or, or anything thank you thank you uh nicola um again uh, is there is this steering some uh, more reflections from uh, from the audience? I don't know if uh, Anthony would like uh, to say maybe some some reflections on all this. <laughs> I think I think both of you, yeah, absolutely. I think that if we want to bring it back a little bit towards the issue of democracy, uh, you heard some extremely interesting positions, and uh, I think that we don't really have the answers as yet to most of the questions. Uh, so I'll just make a couple of observations. I think we've all agreed then that there will be misuse. And uh, this is inevitable, I think, the same way, according to your analogy, Peter, um, there was misuse of nuclear power, and uh, we're trying to control now. <coughs> and uh, there are some voluntary um, agreements that have been signed, and also the use of nuclear power is considered something unthinkable. Uh, the question is, how do you reach uh, such a position to think of the use of artificial intelligence in ways that are unthinkable. And uh, because this is what you're really talking about, uh, that there is a certain point, call it an inflection point, call it an ethical point, that makes the use of artificial intelligence unacceptable. Um, that's the first thing, and I don't know how this can be defined and whether we can really define it in terms of ex ante, or whether it's going to be something that is going to result <laughs> as a result of <laughs> a major <laughs> destruction. That would be the first thing. Um, the second thing is uh, how do you prevent the spread uh, of the misuse? Um, again, I bring it back to the question of democracy. I think that the game from that point of view is lost uh, when uh, you talk about countries like China. I've been reading that now they're going to use, uh, you'll be using the, the palm of your hand uh, uh, in order to do anything. Because there's a uniqueness in, uh, in your palm and you'll be able to pay money, you'll be able to get into the bus, uh, get off the bus or anything, so everything you do is absolutely controlled. So I think that may be considered for the moment as a, as a loss, a total loss. The question is, uh, what do you do? Uh, in democracies in terms of institutional um, oversight to prevent uh, these from spreading. I mean, we've had the example, I mean, Giuseppe mentioned the uh, Oxford Analytics, but uh, we can mention the fact of the uh, programs that follow your, uh, whatever you say and whatever you do. Like, what was it called, Predator or something? 
and uh, that uh, is not very easy to control. So it then comes down, in my opinion at least, and by no means an expert in artificial intelligence, as an economist I'm way far <laughs> from that, uh, but it comes down, number one, to the issue that Nicholas mentioned. Uh, there seems to be a speed in developing uh, in the developments that cannot be controlled. And uh, I'm wondering whether we should pay any attention, and this was not mentioned at all, to the fact that there were 500 people, uh, top people in artificial intelligence and related matters, that did sign uh, an appeal for a moratorium on developments. And I don't know whether that really means something or not, but to me, as a layman, it did mean something. That was number one. And uh, the second is, I don't mean to be uh, uh, critical, but uh, Gabriel, it appeared to me that the approach that you have um, for the moment, and I mean, what you're trying to do is extremely difficult, extremely difficult to realize this, because you're really breaking ground from, uh, from, from, from everywhere. Um, but it appears to me as if there's a kind of approach that is like as if you're approaching the production, uh, the, the, the a product. And I'm wondering whether on the issue of artificial intelligence, this is really sufficient. Uh, I mean, it's all very good to say, okay, I want uh, a medical device not to do harm to a person, which reminds me a little bit of Isaac Asimov's one for the robot laws. <laughs> uh, and that you can control, absolutely. But how can you control uh, the emotional impact? Uh, how can you, that may happen, or that may be, that you, you will see, or the misuse in democracies? Because uh, that is something insidious. You, you, it, it will come through at a moment when you don't expect it, the way that this thing is developing. So you may find all of a sudden that a basic issue of democracy or a basic tenant of democracy has been undermined without us realizing it. I'm sorry, I'm just putting some more questions to all of you, and that's all I meant to do. Well, Anthony, great, great food uh, for thought and uh, great quote, uh, quoting of uh, Asimov. Uh, uh, we could also quote the three laws of robotics over there, which I think could be uh, the uh, guiding principles of everything we are discussing uh, about. But um, but yeah, I, I, I think that will be worth, uh, Gabriela, you've been... <laughs> Uh, caught into, uh, in, I mean, being called uh, directly by uh, by Anthony on that. I, I suppose that indeed it was a very hard exercise, and that there are blind spots in that. But there is this uh, square the circle kind of, a, you know, you try from one side to prevent any kind of harm, but on the other hand, you want, and this was the question to Nicolas at the end, you w don't want to prevent to stop. Uh, the 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 innovation which can do also a lot of good. So it's this kind of trade-off that uh, is very uh, uh, important because we are seeing the potentiality of uh, of technology, but uh, we are seeing also the risk of the technology. So it is indeed. I mean, I I'm, I was not in your in your shoes, but I suppose that indeed was a very hard exercise. Yes, uh, I, I, you know, in some respects, uh, the more I, I listen to, uh, I've been around quite a few talks and, you know, to people also having a critical attitude about the act. So many people praise it, indeed praise this fact that we launched in this exercise um, before anyone else. Um, and we break, we broke new ground, as you said. Uh, but when you're the first mover, you also take some risks, you, you know, there are always some risks. You can, you know, the others watch what you're doing, how is it going, and they can pick what is working and what not what is not working. So, uh, indeed, I think it was a bit uh, uh, on our end, uh, but also an act of courage, I would say, to say, we go ahead, we do this, and um, we did our best, as I mentioned before, to make sure that we are covering what we want to cover without leaving loopholes, but also 
going back to your question at the beginning, we wanted to strike a balance between protection versus innovation. That's why the white paper was the ecosystem of excellence and trust. Uh, we do believe that this is a technology that uh, should be, uh, is beneficial, can be beneficial for humanity. It just has to be put in the proper guardrails. And so how to square the balance? The main choice was to have this risk-based approach, including having the scope for extending these possible use cases that lead to risk. This was for us, sorry, our, um, our way to solve, thank you, our way to solve this conundrum of how much do we go now versus how much you know do we go in the future and in case we miss something now we can do that some later that's why annex three the one of the category is um uh, i have to read it now because i don't remember but the the, the exact formulation but it's about democratic administration of justice and democratic processes so the area would allow in the future the commission, if this is retained as such, to indeed introduce systems that would have an impact on democratic process. And I think actually the, the parliament added the use cases there. Um, then of course, to the question that you mentioned of, um, you know, almost um, things that can unexpectedly sort of come Again, my, my, my reaction there to that is to say, again, let's, let's not forget those that we have also a groundbreaking piece of legislation, which is GDPR, because AI does not work without data. Notably, everything that has an impact on the way we think, on the way we operate, on the way we vote, on the way we decide, is based on our personal data. We should not forget that. And, and for that, the AI Act didn't need to do anything. Because indeed, we believe that GDPR is uh, a comprehensive piece of legislation that caters for that need. That doesn't mean, of course, the act is, is, is perfect or should not you know, be changed as the commission proposed. But I think from our perspective, it need, in, again, I stress this, it needs to be seen in conjunction with the other ecosystem of your law that already exists that also then needs to be applied together. I don't know if someone else would like to react. I see yes, Peter. Please. Yes, because it, well, well, the I'm very grateful, Anthony, for your thoughts, and there were some referring to, to some um, aspects I was covering. Um, I think you were asking, you know, if if we can ex ante say something, if the kind of tipping point, or you were referring as ethical point, is not not reached. I'm not so sure if if it's really not reached yet. You know, if you think like think like try to imagine like thirty years ago, someone would have told you, "Look, there's a technology product on the market, which allows a dictatorship to manipulate democratic voting in a democracy in Europe, in the U.S. Can this product be on the market or not? Probably all. I mean, I would assume majority would have said, "No, not possible. There will be legal consequences. There will be legal boundaries, even to stop that." introduction of the of the product into the market what happened it is on the market it is still on the market and i'm not seeing from that specific company the steps you would expect it to perform to address this human rights relevant issue in a meaningful way i give another example why i would say this tipping point is reached if you look at the CO2 emissions in the energy consumption by database systems and combine it with the climate destruction we are experiencing, I would even in that area say this is kind of threatening the planet and the ecosystem. And again, I think we have reached a tipping point there. But I think it's really the time, there's an urgency to act in order to, what you were describing very wisely is that it goes slowly into a democratic system and then it's gone, like the democratic system is gone before we can actually do something about it. So we need to do something in preventing this to, to happen. 
and the other thing I wanted to to uh, emphasize is that I, I think it was very helpful by uh, like that that Nicholas um, pointed out the, f the fact of speed because I think that we can of course tackle speed from two sides we can make sure that democratic processes are faster happening faster and I think to a certain extent there's also potential in that area but then we can also do something about slowing down technology-based innovation processes. That sounds maybe a little bit strange to say that, looking at the econ economic potential in it. But if you look at two other industries, like, for example, the pharmaceutical industry, of course there is a regulatory authority. Of course it takes time to put a medical product, a medical drug on the market. I mean, of course, there's also controversies if that's too long and too fast, this process of admission to the market, approval to the market. But the existence itself of such a regulatory authority, of such a admission approval process, is not questioned at all. Why can I put racist, sexist, hate speech products on the market, make much money out of it, without any legal sanctions. And this is happening in the 21st century. So what I'm trying to say, we need a regulatory authority, and I think we need to, um, I, again, welcome what the EU is doing, but I think we need that on a global level. And that would be something, a function which I would expect the either to fulfill to also make approval of market access in order to protect humans from human rights violations by sexist apps, by racist apps, by racist hate speech on social media platforms. I think we have reached a tipping point also when mid with, thanks to whistleblowers of at that time Facebook, now Meta, have shown us that we have to, I mean, we have to get that in our minds. I mean, there were people sitting in a meeting room discussing, look, there are people killing each other on the street, thanks to the hate speech we have created and escalated in our social media platforms, should we do something about it? Hmm, if we escalate it further, we earn more money, we make more profit, hmm, let's escalate it. Even if people killing each other on the street based on the misinformation they have received on the platforms. So that's another example I would say we have reached a tipping point and urgent action is needed to protect humans and the planet from the negative sides. And also, let me emphasize that, also in order to explore better the positive potential, because I think we're lacking on that. I think, for example, if you take healthcare robots, we are focusing on efficiency, we are focusing on making healthcare systems more profitable. I think we should focus on making healthcare better better regarding quality. But that needs, you know, a reorientation of the purpose of the focus itself. And when some of you think, well, this cannot be work, it, can't, it cannot work, you know, from an economic, an economic point of view, I just wanted to give you the example. I mean, look at the US American aviation industry. It was successful because there was very specific, very well-developed regulation enforced very thoroughly allowing that industry to explode from an econ economic point of view. So I would say if we are able to make very specific, target-oriented and then enforce very thoroughly regulation, that can actually create spaces for successful businesses, for successful innovation. And I think it's time to get to act instead of continuing to make another recommendation another beautiful guideline, another beautiful declaration. We really need now regulation in place, an enforcement mechanism in place on a global level. Well, you, you remind me uh, of uh, obviously uh, episodes of Black Mirrors that can be quoted over there about this reaching tipping points on, on that. I don't know if you uh, if you are familiar with the, with the series. Um, I would like to, to hear from, uh, what's your name again? Kim. It was actually, um, it was a question that Anthony, Anthony already brought it up about, um, specifically about the moratorium and w whether that could be useful. Um, I think the letter specifically called for a six-month pause, I believe it was, and whether that um, 
could be a possible solution or would that slow down uh, innovation too much? I'm kind of curious what Jeremy might think about that. Um, and then I also, this is a kind of a second question that was, it was brought up a couple of times um, about labeling um, and the watermark uh, and whether or not, um, because I noticed, well, Gabrielle isn't here anymore, um, but he talked about um, that they made the decision not to label everything in the, in the most recent um, version of the law, that it would just be, I believe, audio and video that would need to be labeled um, as AI. Uh, and curious about the panel's thoughts about that, whether, you know, that's why not text? I mean, if people are falling in love with chatbots um, who are text-based, then why shouldn't that be uh, watermarked as well? So those two areas, mm -hmm. the moratorium and the labeling. Well, m maybe uh, we, we definitely, even if Gabriel is not there, we can take some of our thoughts on, on that. On the moratorium, maybe I have, I have one piece of uh, additional reflection to, to add, uh, which is the overall context in which uh, this whole technological development is uh, taking uh, place and uh, also about international cooperation uh, all in all. I mean, the need for an agency which is of a global scope is definitely the only way to go in order to make such kind of collective action. I'm not speaking just about the moratorium. It could be other kind of collective action possible. But in, in an environment which is uh, highly polarized, uh, uh, especially uh, weaponized uh, in terms of uh, how the technology, especially artificial intelligence, is being seen as uh, uh, sensitive technology of even dual use, uh, possibly used also for military purpose. Uh, in the moment where the United States and China are basically competing with each other on supremacy in this area, um, any kind of moratorium uh, uh, debate is a little bit, uh, um, you know, uh, loses a little bit its, uh, its teeth in the moment where you can say, yeah, okay, uh, these people were mainly uh, Western uh, intellectuals uh, who want a moratorium uh, on the labs uh, in the United States. Well, the first reaction from the United States State Department is like, yeah, but, you know, like what the Chinese are going to do in these six months why we're going to stop everything. Is this something that, is this a risk that we want to take? So uh, the situation is a little bit more complex uh, because there is an aspect about consumer, uh, consumer uh, uh, protection, human rights, democracy, but there is also security aspect and the geopolitical aspect to this discussion, which uh, we cannot uh, uh, forget. Uh, but maybe my colleagues in the panel want to add something on that. And especially on the labeling, which, uh, which. Uh um, well, actually, on the labeling, I wasn't aware that text was excluded. I, I, I admit that uh, uh, maybe I read a different version. Uh, but uh, well done to the, to, to the industry. That sorry, he did mention it. Like yeah, mentioned that the text is excluded. Yeah. Oh, but in the latest, uh, in the latest, I think that has been. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I see, I see. Yeah. So, so I think I think that has been corrected. Uh, like this, uh, this this approach. Like it. Yeah. I'm I'm not entirely sure though. But like yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, for for the moratorium though, uh, the it it does seem that like uh, it's it's difficult operationally to have. Uh, that's why like you know it might be it might be uh, uh, something as as you mentioned, Giuseppe. Like uh, uh, there is still a belief that you know China is racing for this, even though like there's been very effective sanctions that have been imposed on China, which actually like has set back uh, uh, China's ability to develop similar AI system by by probably uh, like five five years or something like that. So six months sounds like a. Uh, we, we, this is the time that that has uh, been brought up. But like also like what we are looking at here when when uh, when we are when we are posing, we have to see what do we do during such a pause, right? Like because such a pause or such a slowdown, right? So of course we can increase the trustworthiness of these uh, of these systems. We can like uh, uh, perhaps like start investing into making some of the systems a bit more uh, reliable. But I do think we are mostly like. We want to start distributing the benefits as well because, like, when we hear about the speed, it, we have to bear in mind that this is very much the speed 
at the cutting edge, right? So this is really something where like uh, uh, ChatGPT being one of the key drivers, right? Like we are not actually seeing uh, much of the, um, you know, like the, 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 you know, when we talk about the human humanitarian needs and, and how AI will help like increase, increase years and all that, like there, there is actually like no need to invest in the cutting edge in order to, to have like for the next 10 years, tremendous economic benefits that would spread away from the tech industry towards other other uh, uh well actually no in the tech industry as well like where when there are more and more clients uh in uh, in other sectors so so we do have like a uh, uh, uh to to bear in mind as well like this this need perhaps instead of investing in like uh the speed at the and the, and the race like actually like starting to to invest in the in making sure that like current systems are being adopted in uh, in various sectors right and and that uh, current systems start benefiting and start being improved in terms of the risks in terms of the uh, the, the risks that they pose right that the, their risks are being mitigated like uh, we have talked about misuse that's a massive uh, massive issue right we we're going to see a bit i mean you know like uh, the 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 the, the Platforms and recommender systems of uh, AI systems of uh, of platforms like Facebook have been abused. Let's you know like this 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 form of innovation and so let's see what it has done to the US. Right, it's it's actually something where we are quite uh, perhaps a bit happier in the EU to not have this uh, uh, this innovation as well. Let's let's bear that in mind. But like overall, right, like uh, this is more also about the ability for the for the the, the society again to absorb uh, this aspect. So. Um, about operationalizing such a pose, even though I don't think China is the key concern here, it might be it might be like something more like uh, at this stage. Uh, even France seems to have uh, joined in into into the race. Like so, th this is just a coordination between a few countries. Actually, would be uh, would be uh, sufficient, or even a coordination between a few companies. But then you have the the antitrust issue, uh, and I do believe that like um, both the FTC and the Commission. Uh, the GCAMP are now considering like okay horizontal uh, cooperation agreements uh, as a, or like allowing such a coordination to take place in order to enhance the safety and uh, and the trustworthiness. But like yeah, this would take need to take place. Thank you. Do you want to add something on? She asked, uh, <laughs> she asked that I'll be much much shorter. Um, yeah, I just don't think that's realistic. I don't, and I actually would, I would make the argument that I don't think it would be good for democracy. Actually, the moratorium, the uh, moratorium, moratorium form. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just don't think it's realistic, and I actually think it would be more harmful to democracy. I think there's too many jurisdictions that are charging forward with that, and you start to get advantages that can't be overcome. That is also coming back to that speed concept. You know, these models and the way they're trained, it is a, it's not a unique aspect to this, but it's an important aspect that just like the EU has noticed in cloud and other technologies. You know, once you fall behind in a certain type of technology with the investment that comes from that, it gets very, very, very hard to catch up. So I do not think that would be a good idea. And on the labeling? He was referring to earlier versions of the text. We're actually participating uh, with other companies in development of a standard that we'll be incorporating into some of the tools we've built in the journalism context in particular with watermarks so that you can identify content that's been made by an AI system. And the prov it's called a provenance standard, in fact, a CP2A. So we're actually working with Intel, Adobe, and others for very much, not just images and video, but uh, text as well. Uh, you'll be seeing that, I think, built into additional I don't really call them fact-checking tools, but tools you can use to look at the provenance of content. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are now at 6.04, and I'm looking at uh, Anthony. Since we were supposed to have a coffee break in between, we... But uh, absolutely, absolutely, please. All these uh, regulatory issues uh, are there and should be there. Uh, there is a first question. Do we foresee that we continue this way? That means we have research performed. We have uh, industrial big companies that produce uh, all the, the new and new and new uh, tools and uh, capabilities. And then we have the countries or the Euro Europe, of course, is our main uh, issue, uh, taking regulatory issues, how to be used. 
Uh, I think uh, what uh, I understand that we can discern misuses and focus there so to, 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 to see that we don't, this does not happen. But, uh, you know, we are at, at a stage that um, whatever happened uh, due to this uh, in, in, uh, increase uh, uh, in inclusion of knowledge in specific systems, like the large uh, uh, models that, uh, language models that appeared, uh, it is the, the one part of the game. We are, as you mentioned there, that uh, you can see also very, very soon <coughs> uh, machines uh, or whatever that they could say that uh, I have also ethical knowledge. That means, uh, on the other side, I have rules, uh, I have uh, uh, also learned uh, the ability to include uh, ethical issues. So we're speaking there that we very soon we'll see cognitive intelligence. So this, it's a bit uh, another issue a bit for, 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 for man, for, for humans, because cognition is not something that it is really there now. But uh, so uh, it is not only the misuses, we are moving towards uh, some new developments that I, I it seems that they will not be far away. That means including huge knowledge and then uh, modeling uh, uh, psychological uh, or whatever ethical issues with democracy issues there. And uh, it's something that, that I don't know if we could control that. Uh, so yeah, I think there are more issues there probably. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, yeah, Peter, please. Well, also because you. I'm losing uh, all the panel, <laughs> 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 so I need I need Peter and Nicolas to to come to the rescue. I'm not <laughs> adding a comment on the professional ethics on that part. No, I'm just kidding. So um, thank you so much for your thoughts. Um, deeply fascinating. Um, you know, I think that maybe in in in, in two steps. Um, on the practical on practical terms. Um, what 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 we tried to implement, be that University of Lausanne, but also you know at the ETH Zurich, where there's the ETH uh, AI Center, which is one of the largest research hubs on the planet, we are trying to to get more research interaction happening, or young researchers in simplifying now tech disciplines interacting with ethics right from the start, because I think there you can change a lot in how research will look like in the future if you're already at the beginning taking into account also ethical concerns, ethical questions, ethical to topics, and can then you know implement them in the research and innovation process rather than to run the innovation process until the end and then the ethics committee comes into the game and says, listen, we have issues here. No one likes that to happen. So, and it's also a waste of time, it's a waste of talent, it's a waste of resource. We are trying to do that. And, and you know, the first preliminary results of that are very promising on both sides because the discipline of ethics learns a lot from cutting edge technology, tech research, but also, of course, tech research can be also informed by, you know, ethics as an academic discipline. Now, coming back to your point that, you know, we can expect database systems to be ethical in, in sooner than later future, I would like to propose to differentiate between, you know, database systems with ethics which I would argue we have already now. Like you can train a self-driving car that it is following ethical principles, not killing anyone, for example, and this car will perform that action. Differentiating that from ethical database systems, because at there I would say it's not only something which is not reachable now, but I would also argue it's not reachable even for the future, even if we have cognitive um, database system in place. Why? Because I would say um, we have to be very precise on what ethics is about. You know, ethics is about principles, norms, and there you'd say, well, you can train database systems in that and cognitive database systems will be able to even surpass what humans are able to perform in that area of ethics. Ethics is more than that though, you know, like we have complexity of ethics. You were referring to dual use, for example. You have ambivalence, so you can have something which is leading to something good, but by doing this, it's also leading to something bad at the same time. What is gonna, what, what, what should we do with that? And when humans are confronted with such, such situations based on our freedom and based on, our moral, on, based on the freedom we have moral capability, we are able to then perform very complex processes in order to get the ethical right thing in that situation done. And I would like to add to that, making it more complex, um, we have also to, st to deal with in ethics with the so-called rule transcending uniqueness of the concrete the rule transcending uniqueness of the concrete. What is that? So for example, if you take yeah, take, take um, situation in the time of the Nazi regime, you were hosting Jews at your home, you were giving them 
cover, the Nazis were knocking at your door and would ask you, do you have Jews in your home? Now you have two ethical principles to follow. You have the one, oh, you shouldn't lie. And the other one, of course, you should save these human lives. Which one is now more important? Now, you, we notice that in that concrete situation, in that concrete encounter with concrete humans, we need to break one ethical rule in order to reach the higher ethical good, which is, depending on the situation, always different. The rule transcends the uniqueness of the concrete, which is not really surpri surprising because every time we are putting rules into place, we have to be aware of the fact that these rules will know gaps because reality is just too complex. Now, I can imagine training database systems in you know, doing the, the easy ones, like, you know, it's, it's more important to save a human life than to not lie. But it will be impossible, I would argue, to train database systems in dealing with the rule transcending uniqueness of the concrete. What we're looking right now in, an, in a present day research project at the ETH Zurich is, okay, which part of ethics can, will be covered by database systems? And which part of ethics will be hard for database systems looking at it, of course, you know, within the limits of human reasoning and, of course, from a nowadays perspective, will be difficult for, for, for database systems to be reached. In order to then reach the most in the area where database system can assist us, where it can help humans to become better humans, and also to be realistic on the part of ethics which still should remain in human hands in order to be sensitive to the rule transcending uniqueness of the concrete. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, I think that on this note, uh, we may have to conclude. I uh, would like to, to thank everyone for, for this very uh, interesting conversation, and obviously this is not the end of it, uh, first of all, because uh, we are going to keep working on, on that issue. And uh, and secondly, for the challenge that uh, you you have within the project to uh, take uh, home some of these uh, uh, food for thought in order to uh, uh, contribute to those building blocks for democracy of the future, which you are trying to uh, reflect upon. So thank you so much to everyone, and I believe that there are, there I see something on the tables over there. So before. Before you leave, uh, uh, make sure that, uh, that we can have a, a little moment of informal uh, networking as well. Thank you so much. Goodbye.